Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this live training webinar workshop today, okay? We'll be teaching you a lot about how to improve your photography website and we're gonna actually let you know a lot of little tips and secrets so you can guys uh, not only improve your website but improve your SEO, your Google rankings, get more clients. That's what we all want, right? Because even though we love to take pictures, what we're trying to do at the end of the day is have a profitable business in which in which we can actually make a living from it, okay? So um, my name is Gaston. Uh, together with Alex, we'll be co-hosting this webinar together. And the idea here is to have a, a steady conversation. You guys can use the Q&A section. We love to read uh, questions from you. So if you think we're talking too broad about any topics, feel free to use the Q&A section ask anything. We both have years of experience on this. We'll be talking about our experience in a moment, but um, if we're not going too technical on something, it's because not everybody's up to that level yet. But if you do want to know something really technical, I know either Alex of my, or myself will be able to answer your questions because we've both been doing this for years. Right, Alex? Yeah, exactly. We're both open to emails from everyone. We're happy to answer questions. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, let me tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a wedding photographer. I've been shooting weddings for 10 years. Um, I started in 2010 and I've been shooting weddings nonstop. I had some crazy years with 80 to 90 weddings per year. Now I'm trying to lower that to maybe 35 to 50 events per year. So I'm still shooting a lot of weddings. That's where my main income comes from. Uh, but I'm also a coach for photographers. Uh, I'm trying to mentor photographers so I can push you guys into have a more profitable business. So uh, I do have a very profitable business myself. Uh, every year I'm making over 100, 150K. I'm talking about US dollars. I know we all come from different parts of the world. So I know I can help you uh, step up your, your photography game and your business game. So if you are looking for coaching or mentoring, I'll be happy to talk over email. You don't need to purchase anything, guys. We're just here to teach you something today and we're not gonna push sales or any of that, okay? This is a live workshop in which you will learn a lot. Now, Alex, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm a web designer basically and I work exclusively with photographers and have been doing so for 12 years already. Um, time flies. I run this uh, website uh, for Ground Web, F O R E, groundweb.com, and it's all about photography websites. It's basically an educational resource, a ton of articles, resources, and all of the web design services that I can offer to photographers. You can find everything there, basically. Uh, you can check both of our websites. Uh, after this is done and you can get in touch with us for any further questions that we cannot answer now. Before we go further, um, I think we both would like to know a bit more about who is watching this. So you've already started doing that, which is great. If anyone else hasn't written yet, go to the Zoom chat window and just type a quick message there stating your photography niche in your country. We've already gotten some pretty interesting results. I, we, we both kind of want to get a feel of what the audience is here so we can kind of tailor what we talk about to try to make this more useful for you. And some right. interesting results so far. Exactly. And guys, uh, it's very useful for us to know what kind of photography business do you have? Because uh, if you're trying to sell fine art, it's not the same as if you're, run, if you're selling wedding photography, for example, or pet photography, or real estate or architectural photography. So uh, the concept for the how to fix a website is similar. So you will all, uh, all of you will get great insights from this webinar today. But it will be very interesting if you can ask questions specifically to, about your photography niche. So we can go in depth about that for a minute. And um, of course, if you're trying to get into a very different niche, you can reach out via email later to any of us and we both uh, be able to help, okay? So for any questions you might have, it will be awesome. And uh, everything I'm seeing right now is a lot of portrait-based businesses. Uh, some fine art, which I'm surprised, guys, because uh, most of 
our content, I think, Alex, is geared towards portrait photographers, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But many other specialties should should be should yeah. apply. And based on the chat messages, some most people I see are already established photographers, or or they already have some sort of business. Uh, I don't know at what stage. I've also seen a couple of people starting out. They want to build their first website or their initially. So we kind of have to talk to both groups. That is awesome. And people from all over the world, thank you guys for hanging out uh, at this time of the day, which might be crazy for some of you. I know we have uh, people from all over the world. So Bristol in the UK, full-time commercial photographer in PR events, editorial and portrait photography. Miami, done two or three weddings and three families last year. Uh, Fabricio, if you've done two or three weddings, you need to start building a portfolio. And if that's what you want to get into, we'll help you today. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit about building a portfolio, choosing the right niche, narrowing down, uh, and choosing the right customers, saying no to the wrong ones, get the good ones. And guys, if you're going to get a lot of information about uh, <laughs> no more weddings, says Fabricio. Okay. Yeah. So don't get into that. If, if they are not your thing, uh, I'm glad because there's less competition for all of us, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's Andy Butler from England, portraiture and weddings, uh, studio stuff. Marcos from Brazil, photo sessions and elopement weddings. Interesting. Okay, so um, yeah. I'm living in Punta Cana. Oh, Marco, you know what? I just found looking at the attendees, I just have like six or seven competitors of mine right there, which is great to be honest it's great i love i love that that they're following this so they, they can actually learn something from me and i love to talk to you guys later and see if you actually uh improve your websites after this webinar which i know you will uh alex shall we go about what we're gonna teach today yeah sure sure so, so go, ahead. go ahead no no go ahead uh basically uh we just we are doing this event uh, just to um, encourage people that they can build a proper, amazing website, that that website can help their business and they can find new clients, even though the industry is saturated and we all have problems and have a hard time finding clients. This is all about getting more clients and getting more revenue. We never lose sight of that main focus. And that's why we're doing this whole presentation uh, hopefully to teach people all about it. Um, Want to go, go through the agenda a bit? Yeah, of course. Guys, um, as, as Alex said, the important thing here is making money, okay? We're going to talk about making a, a website that will get, turn your business into a profitable one. We don't want just to talk about photography in general because you can find that everywhere else. We want to tell you what you need to do to improve your website and get more clients to book your services, Okay. So as you can read in the agenda, we're gonna talk about simplifying your website. We should make it clear and easy to use, choosing the right platforms. We'll go a little bit uh, to talk about WordPress, Squarespace, all the alternatives that photographers are trying these days, some with great results, some with awful ones. You don't wanna be in that uh, group, okay? Then we're gonna talk about making your website mobile friendly, improving performance guys speed is key speed is everything if your website takes 10 seconds to load your customers are going to leave no matter how good your pictures are okay image metadata alt tags text content fresh content okay we're going to talk about your bio your elevator pitch and your contact info if you don't know what this is this is about making yourself different from your competitors like alex said the market is saturated guys there's a, a, you should I don't know your area, Alex, but in mine, you lift a rock and you see a photographer, you look outside the window and you see another photographer. Guys, there's a ton of people, especially with COVID, a lot of people are turning like their free time to a photography business, which might hurt us or might be great for us because if you're better than them, you can have, raise your prices, charge premium prices, have a, lux a luxury business instead and make a lot of money. So we're gonna go briefly over email marketing, paid advertising, positioning, and then we're going to do a short Q&A at the end. Uh, hopefully, you guys will be asking questions throughout the webinar so we can stop and answer that as we talk through, the, through these topics. But if you have any remaining questions that don't fit any of the sections, 
we'll have a short Q&A towards the end so you can ask whatever you want, okay? And, and for the Q&A, it's better that everyone uses the, the Q&A feature in Zoom because that way we can easily track the questions and mark the time when we answer them instead of using the, just the chat window where it's just a big river of messages. Exactly. Cool. So let's get started. Um, let me start us off with a topic that I'm very fond of and then I really want to nail to clarify for everyone. I feel we're, we're all living in a distraction era. I mean, someone lands on your photography website and uh, they just give you their attention for a few seconds until their phone dings with a notification or they get lost on social media or something. People have kind of learned to jump from one thing to another very quickly. And because of this distraction mode, I think that browsing habits everywhere have changed, right? Uh, people get confused very easily. If they notice any mistakes or problems on your website, they, they leave. If they take a second more to decipher what your website is all about, they leave, right? They don't have patience to sit through anything. So Google is also trying to make sense of all these browsing habits and turning them into ranking factors. I know that many photographers are obsessed with SEO as well. We don't want to get technical in this. We just want to clarify the, some principles. And this is all where user experience comes into play. Uh, it's about making the website as clear and user-friendly for people as possible. And we're, we're going to try to list a few ways in which you can do that. And to start with, a topic um, I'm, I cannot overstate is to simplify your navigation menu. Um, you can see kind of a, a survey, some survey statistics that I put there in the presentation. Um, and I know another one um, in my mind, uh, I think that eight, more than 80% of visitors leave a website just because it takes them too many clicks to get to what, where, what they wanted to find. They get lost, so they leave. That's, that's bad, obviously. And sorry uh, to interrupt you, Alex, sure. but I've seen a lot of photographers uh, trying to become too artsy with their websites. So they have these massive slideshows and the menu is kind of hidden because there's such a low contrast between the menu and the pictures that are displaying that it's impossible to navigate your websites, guys. So like, like Alex was saying, try to make it as easy. Think, of your, think about your user. They, they will give you like three to five seconds of their attention. Try to use those three to five seconds to point them to where, they, where you want them to go. You tell them what they have to do. The same thing as if you were, have them in front of your camera, you tell them, hey, go do this or that. Same thing you wanna tell them through your menu on your website. Okay, and if you don't know how to improve the, the navigation menu on your website, the, the few guidelines you should know are placement. You should place it at the top of the website or on the left-hand side. If you choose any, uh, any other location, you're asking for trouble, basically. And it's not just about ad, that it's about being consistent. So whatever location you do choose for the navigation menu, make sure it's always there. Like in, in the top example here, when you navigated to the blog section of that website, the whole menu changed, a completely different menu item. So you, you got lost, you felt like it was a, a separate website and you didn't know how to navigate it anymore. Whereas the second example, just nail that because it's, it's all consistent. And then finally, the number of menu items. This is a big pet peeve of mine. And uh, Gaston, tell me, uh, the top three <laughs> examples have up to 12 menu items. If you were it's, to go there, wouldn't you feel confused? There's, there's yeah, I'll, I'll go crazy, I'll leave. But there's, there's an acronym that I love, which is KISS, which is keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hope nobody feels offended by this, but keep it simple. Tell them where you want to go. Don't give them like a brochure of options. You don't want to confuse them. And it's like, oh, should I go to the testimonials, the books, the media? Just put all that in it. First of all, you don't need to show every single thing you ever done. 
Try to simplify. Tell them, hey, you need to go to the blog if you want to see my latest work. You need to go to the contact button towards the right on top right of the website because it's always there. It should be there. So simplify the menu as much as you can. So like Alex was saying, the top thing is confused. It's, it's, for me, it's very complicated. I will just, if you have to think too much, you're living. Yeah, the, those, those three examples basically just became dumping grounds of all the pages the photographer added over time to the website without taking anything out. And it's, it's, it's a nightmare. And uh, you were mentioning an interesting thing uh, earlier, which is when photographers get too creative, this kind of applies to the navigation menu as well, because the words you use also matter in terms of uh, familiarity, right? You can call it about or bio, but don't call it skills or experience or company info or anything like that. The same with contact, which should usually, usually stays at the end of the menu. It, it's okay to call it contact or contact us, but not get in touch or how to reach me or send a message. That extra half a second of confusion stops people from actually going there. Exactly. And uh, guys, something that it's, uh, honestly, I don't remember if we're going to go through about this a little bit later, Alex, but if you click the contact button, what you see next, it should lead, it should force you to send an email. It should force you to fill a simple contact form. Don't just... Mm -hmm drive people crazy. It's like, okay, press contact and now I'm going to see 12 testimonials first and then I'm going to see a bunch of gallery pictures. And then if you want to see pricing, I'm going to send you somewhere else, which is what most people do. If I press contact, it's because I want to get in touch with you. And enforcing that with just a couple testimonials well placed should help, but don't just give me 12 options on what to do when I press something as simple as contact. Yeah, those are good. some good tips. Okay. Beyond the, the navigation menu, another good way to improve a website is just through a few typography improvements, right? To increase the readability. So I know this, we're talking about photography websites and they're image heavy, but you do have text. You do have some intro text on the homepage or some blog posts or your services or your bio page. To make the typography better, there are usually just, if, if anyone were to follow just three simple guidelines, things would be better. Number one is to choose a good font face. So choose a font that kind of matches your logo for consistency and that's in, in tune with your website. Number two is to increase the font size. You, I've seen too many websites with the font tiny that's too tiny, exactly. And also to increase the line height so it's comfortable, the spacing between rows. If you nail those three things, you're in a better place. Of course, there are other things like you see in these two examples. Uh, from left to right, I made a few other changes in this experiment. Uh, I broke long, boring blocks of text into paragraphs. You can use headings or subheadings to where appropriate, you know, to, to break the content. You can improve the font color, the spacing, alignments, all sorts of stuff. We won't go too technical now. And also, guys, something especially about this slide that you're seeing right now, you don't want to justify your text so you have this weird spacing in between words. Keep it, keep it simple. Like It should be the same as when you read a book. Things should be simple, easy to see and understand from a distance. You don't, you don't want to get way too close to be able to read something, okay? Also, uh, like he was saying, I don't know, Alex, if you have a preference for me, uh, like a font size shouldn't be any lower le le than 14 or 15, actually 16, yeah. 17. Yeah, I, I recommend 16, 17 at least, yeah. 16, 17 is like the sweet spot. If you have uh, very little information, you can go up to 18 or 20, but I would stay around 16 pixels, guys. Uh, you should make it work and it should be super simple. I go through your website, if I wanna scan, scan, skim, and, and just find the most important thing, I should be able to. Okay. With these two things, details out of the way, of course, when it comes down to the user experience on a website, it comes, it comes down to content and that's images. That's the bulk of your work, the heart of your work, which is your photography. 
And the big mistake here is that um, many photographers are just putting mediocre content on in galleries because they're afraid to pick and choose, right? Content curation is a difficult skill and not many photographers master that. And it's really important. If you have a, a, a portfolio gallery, just put your best work in there, 15, 20 images, just aim to impress people and not to put too much. Or if you have a big stock archive, okay, group your galleries and collections, how it makes sense so people navigate your archive easier. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't know, from your experience, uh, Gaston, um, have, you, have you seen photography websites where they put closely related photos, like variations of the same photo next to each other, uh, like the same photo in color and black and white? To me, it just sounds like the photographer couldn't make a decision of what's better, so why should I trust them? Exactly, unless there's a clear intention, guys, and by clear, I mean when you see it, you should see that it's either a sequence or something that it's really worth showing twice. Because if not, simplify, cat, cat, cat. And uh, when you're choosing the pictures on your portfolio, I would really encourage you to ask somebody. Uh, if it's another photographer, it works. If it's a client, even better. You want to know what people are looking for in your images. You don't want to show a hundred uh, pictures of the same thing if your clients are actually looking for something else. And like Alex was saying, if you have six variations of the same pictures, choose one. You don't need to choose four, you don't need to choose two. Choose one and get the best one and get another one, another fantastic picture next to it. And people will understand that you have the variations and it, it's not the only thing you ever did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. We're talking about all these ways to improve a photography website, but sometimes it's, it's really hard to do that because you're, you're too close to your own work. You don't have the perspective. And first time visitors, so people landing on your homepage for the first time, they don't think like you. They've never seen your website. I, I call them a different beast, right? They, they behave differently. And here's what I think makes them different. Uh, number one is, their trust starts at zero, right? They never saw your work. They, they, they're they skeptical. They don't know what you're capable of. Uh, they're not familiar with your website, how it's structured and all of that. And they have high expectations. So you have to try to think like them. And we thought of a few ways in which you can do that. And um, the first one is to try to empathize with them, to try to think like them, to, to view your website with, with, with fresh eyes. So ask yourself things like, when someone comes to, to this homepage, what are they looking for? Uh, do they want to hire me as a photographer to view my prices, to view my services? Do, you, do they want to purchase stock images for me or whatever? And can they get to that information quickly or are they overwhelmed by everything i'm gonna i'm gonna add something to that what i see some people doing is especially what you were talking like you just meet someone would you ask them to purchase something from you it's it's like hey you, you just meet a pretty girl in the street and it's like hey do you want to marry me and it's like what she'll probably slap you same thing happens with your website guys somebody goes in for the first time you don't want to ask them to buy right away. You want to educate them. You want to show them what you can do. You want to get their trust. And once you got their trust, they might be more inclined to buy from you. So make sure that you put a lot of effort into educating your clients, showing them why you're different, showing them different reasons, or, or even you can show even backstage or whatever makes them trust you. So when they have to make a decision between you and the other hundred photographers that sell a similar service, not the same because we're all different, but if, you, if you're competing with in a saturated market like most of us are, you wanna be different somehow. So educate your clients, gain their trust. And once you did that, you can tell them, hey, you should be doing this, you should be getting this, and this is the best option for, what, for your needs. Um, it's not the same for a real estate photographer than, than for a wedding photographer, but if you're shooting real estate, the same thing. 
take, um, take realtors through your process. Show them your before and afters so they understand the best times of the day uh, to get you towards the house. Show them the importance of cleaning the house before you show up to take pictures. And all these things, the, the minute they just type your website, get in there, and they see that you're actually teaching them something, they are going to give you your cre their, their credit card in, in like 10 minutes if, if you do your job right. Exactly. So then you turn them from first time visitors to returning visitors because they now trust you and they understand what your website is all about. Exactly. Good. So um, let me, there's a, there's a culty sure. hunter ask a question, which I like to, to, to answer before, before we keep moving. Oh. Um, Okay, so Colty, I think everybody can read this, but just in case I'm gonna read it out loud. I communicate the importance of story in imagery, thus providing something more than photos. Should I share the story for a given body or sub collection of work? Um, I'm gonna give my answer uh, first, then Alex, if you have any inputs, feel free to, feel free to continue with or, or disagree with me. Well, uh, so what I'd like to say is Colty, uh, first of all, I would focus on what your clients need and want. If you just uh, share an image without a backstory, in, in this case, you're, I'm assuming that it's very important for them and for yourself, uh, it, w it shouldn't be enough. So I would say, show that image and instead of showing it as a portfolio, you wanna show that image as a unique page. So you show that image and then the story. And if you have some sort of way to tell the story through images, even better, okay? So try to make your work uh, work in a way that you can actually uh, get them into the story, show them a little bit of something, keep them intrigued, and then you can show your best picture towards the end if you want, so you can sell it as story, as story first and then accompany that with an image, or you can show the image and then put the background of that story. But I think uh, in your particular case, it wouldn't work if you just post, uh, like, like most photographers do a portfolio of 20 disconnected images from one another. I would just showcase uh, your most important work and put as much information as, you, as your client or uh, viewers need. Okay, so you know who they are. I don't know which niche, uh, which niche you're into. So if you wanna go a little bit more into detail, we can, but if not, uh, I would say focus on the story. Yes, definitely. I, I think you were spot on and it definitely depends on, uh, on your target audience. Exactly. If they're looking for stories, if they're the type of clients who do want to get immersed in the story or they're just quickly looking to shop for an image. It really depends on your niche. Yeah, I agree. If you have any other questions, guys, feel free to keep asking through the Q&A. Exactly. Good. So um, let's talk a bit about something more technical, which is platforms and tools <laughs> yeah. and templates. Uh, just, just the basics, right? We don't want to overwhelm people. Um, unless, you, unless you want to know something more in depth, guys, feel free to ask. Yeah, exactly. I feel that there's now kind of a healthy competition in the industry. You know, there are photography platforms, specifically geared towards photographers. And those platforms are trying to improve, but they're, they're all feeling the heat from WordPress, which is kind of the big elephant in the industry, right? It powers a third of the internet and it's catching up in certain aspects. Could you, um, could you name a few so everybody knows which platforms are we talking about? Sure. So um, I think that photography uh, specific platforms would be the big players in the industry, uh, SmugMug, uh, Photo Shelters, and Folio, Format, uh, Pixpa, uh, Photofolio, Livebooks, Koken. I think even PixieSat is offering websites as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So those are geared towards photographers. Whereas on the other hand, you have general uh, platforms, WordPress, the big player in the industry, and then you have other smaller ones, uh, Squarespace, Wix, Weebly, and a few other ones. Yeah. Uh, it, which one do you use usually, by the way? I, I built a, like dozens of websites, not as, not as many as you did. And I, every single time I, I, 
I even analyze the whole thing again and I, I and always end up going for WordPress. It's my go-to for everything I do. Um, of course, you can talk about uh, the pros and the cons of, of what you think is best about the other ones. But for me, WordPress, it's always about the flexibility. It's, mm -hmm. It gives me so many options that if I, dis I change my mind in two months and I want to change the, the aesthetics or the menu or or even add like a WooCommerce to sell something, I don't really, really need to, um, to go to just change the whole process because I don't know I picked the wrong template on Squarespace or something like that. Yeah, so it has the flexibility to grow in the future, which is a, a really important factor, I agree. Um, the inverse of flexibility, I guess it's complexity. That's why I'm a huge fan of WordPress myself and I use it mostly, but there are scenarios where it might not be the best fit because maybe the photographer is not very tech savvy or they don't need all the bells and whistles. They don't need all the power and they're just looking for just a quick portfolio, just show some images and that's it. In which case, maybe it's not the best fit, but Usually, if they want to grow in the future and build a strong website, maybe WordPress is, is the better option, but it comes down to other factors. There's costs involved. There's SEO, if they need some more SEO stuff, which WordPress, dealing, again, is better, and other dealing features. With hosting services and, and yeah. plugins, and the plugins don't work together pretty well. So yeah. you, I, I've been talking to some photographers that I've been working with and uh, I always try to tell them the same thing. If you have some technical skills, like if you're good at the tech stuff or, or you can actually learn all these skills, I would strongly recommend you to go with WordPress. But if you're not, like I, I, I have people telling me, hey, but I spent like a full week trying to fix my menu and it's something that a designer or somebody like you and, and myself, Alex, it will take us probably two or three minutes but you know people spending a week because they don't know the line of code that gets something in the right spot. Um, so I would say, like you said before, if you're not technical enough, I, I would definitely consider using Squarespace or, or Wix. I think both are great platforms for photographers. Yeah, another scenario that I've come across in my work is when photographers need special features, and by that I mean mostly e-commerce stuff, like when they need to sell prints using uh, automatic fulfillment, so a print lab just gets their order and ships them to the client directly, so it's no touch required by the photographer, yeah. or when they need to sell licenses and rights managed licenses and all of that, not all platforms offer that, so you might be restricted then. But other than that, yeah, I agree. WordPress is a safe recommendation. And now the question then becomes, should you just get some sort of template or just install a theme and you're done with it? Or should you invest in a more custom built bespoke website? And again, it's a big, it depends. It's, it, it's a game of compromises. Again, you're trading flexibility and time and money Right, a, a, a custom website is more complex, it's more expensive, but it's more powerful. Whereas if you go with a template, maybe some people cannot afford to go with a custom website. Let's talk to them just for a yeah. second. Uh, if you do need to, to build something cheaper and you choose a template or a platform that just builds a website and you pick and choose a visual template and you install it and that's it at least do some work to try to differentiate it, to make it unique, right? Because you might look like a thousand other photographers using the same template. So exactly. pick and choose your, put your logo in there, choose your colors, choose uh, different fonts, um, go through the theme settings, through the template settings and tweak how much you can to stand out from the default. Exactly. And, and like you were saying, let's say uh, you should a certain kind of photography. It would be ideal that your color, your color palette, the, the, the design, the colors and everything that you choose aligns to your photography. If you're a light and airy photographer, you don't want to have a dark and bold theme. 
So um, when you do like a like a design, like like Alex was saying, of course the designer will take care of that, and he will he will consider the kind of photography that you do and design based on that. But if you're doing it yourself, some people don't understand that if if you shoot weddings, for example, like I do, you don't want to have a dark and bold theme unless you shoot dark and moody portraits. Um, especially if you shoot, let's say, black and white, you want either a pure white background to showcase the depth of your blacks and your grays, or you just want something like pure black in the, in the background. You don't want something messed up with your images. So um, when, when people are deciding for a kind of template, they just, choose, they just choose because the demos usually look great. And then when they put their images on top, it's like, hey, but you should real estate. Why, why is it all airy and curvy if real estate is all about straight lines and, and properly edited images and, and, and blending, blending skies and things like that? It shouldn't be like, a, like an airy website. So it's important that if you're considering a theme or a designer, uh, you can find out what works best with your photography style. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. Uh, we, we got a question now. Um, it's about narrowing down your target audience. And let's wait a bit for this because exactly. we'll be talking about that later on in a future topic exactly about the target audience and all yeah, of that. Exactly. We'll talk about how to address a certain, a certain group of people so you can actually sell because that's what this whole webinar is about. We want to help you to sell more. Exactly. Uh, for now, let's stick with a few topics about the website themselves a bit, starting uh, with mobile friendliness and then performance. Let's quickly go through them. I think most photographers watching this, they know about this mostly already. They know they should no longer be using Flash. It's been gone 10 years already. They, don't, they know websites should be mobile friendly. They should work. If people check their traffic in Google Analytics, I think many of them will, will find that mobile plus tablet traffic already outgrows the desktop traffic. So it's, it's really important to, to cover that. Yeah, I'm having like a 60% mobile traffic compared to like a 35 from, from desktop and like a 5% from tablet. So in my case, it's even stronger than, than these images. Most of my, my visitors come from mobile. So I'm just designing for mobile. Like I've been doing that for a couple of years now. Yeah. Yeah, same, same here. So obviously everyone should choose a template that's responsive at a minimum. Um, I think there are different levels of mobile friendliness. I mean, it, it's not enough just to pass Google's mobile friendly tests. So you're in the green. Okay, you got a check mark, but is the yeah. experience on the website actually good? I mean, there are templates and templates. Some of them just have some breakpoints. They kind of adapt, but others are responsive. They're fluid. They really flow well on a, on a mobile device. So make sure whatever you choose, you test it thoroughly on your device. Ask some friends to do it as well. It's really important these days. Yeah, I'm going to stop you for a moment, Alex. Uh, Lionel is asking, which themes do we recommend? Um, I have a few that I really like. I don't know if you have a few others. We go, can, go ahead. Yeah. We can. Okay. So, uh, Lionel, uh, there are a lot of great um, WordPress themes. Uh, I'm assuming you're asking about WordPress because you haven't mentioned anything different, and I don't know the name of the Squarespace themes. So, I'm going to focus on WordPress for now. If not, please let us know. Uh, what I would say is, I really like to work with uh, some builders like um, Divi. Elementor, uh, even Beaver Builder. And um, there's a few more that I can think right on top of my head right now, but DB, Elementor, and Beaver Builder are probably the top three that I would recommend if you kind of know what you're doing. If not, uh, going for a builder might feel like a little too much because you have a lot of power with customizing and getting into the depth and technical details and moving the padding like five extra, picture, extra pixels that you might not need all that stuff. So if you're not going for a builder itself, there are a lot of um, other options out there that are based on these builders. 
um, like uh, I there's a couple of themes like Astra or Jupiter or even Divi offers like templates within their own builder. Uh, Elementor Pro also offers uh, some uh, templates and they're all really affordable. I'm talking about like anywhere between 50 to a hundred dollars, something like that. It's something that everybody that owns a business should be able to pay. And again, this might work if you cannot afford the designer, for example, but if you do, if you can, and you don't have the technical skills, I would say skip the themes altogether and focus your attention on getting more customers. And then you could pay a designer to do this for you. If you kind of know what you're, what you're into, what you're looking for. Alex. Okay. I agree with that. The only thing I would add is I get sometimes photographers come to me, they chose a WordPress theme on their own that looked pretty in the demos. They look, exactly. it was for photographer. They, it looked really fancy. And they come to me saying, Hey, I want to do this. I want to change that. And I can't, why is that? And it's just theme limitations the, the their demos look good, but they're not powerful or flexible enough. So then over time, I've kind of started experimenting with more powerful themes and page builders. Like you said, I've used Elementor as well and Divi and if going for a theme and not a page builder, a, a good strong uh, theme already has a page builder included in it. It comes with the plugin included. So go, go through that, go to uh, theme forest, I think is a popular uh, place to purchase yeah. themes. Just sort by most popular, most sales and choose one of the top fives and it should have a good page builder in it. I agree, guys. It's uh, themeforest.net. It's not .com. Themeforest.net. That's your go-to places if you're looking for themes. Uh, like, like Alex was saying, try to sort by popularity, and then it's just themeforest.net. I think you're in a better place to start with a, a powerful theme like that. They're so flexible. I mean, you can build everything with, with them. You can make them as unique as you want it. Um, we also have another question in the chat this time from Lorna and she's asking, uh, what are your top gallery plugins? Uh, I assume we're talking about WordPress again now. Um, I mean, I, I'm aware of uh, NextGen Gallery is obviously a popular one. Uh, it's it has e-commerce functionality as well. And that's why many photographers up to it. It's, it's on the, it's very powerful, maybe too powerful at times. It's very complex if you, if you need to use it. And Vira Gallery, um, if it's just for a simpler portfolio website, sometimes I don't need to use a gallery plugin at all, just because the theme is so powerful and so flexible. It has built-in gallery functions to, to justify or masonry grids of images with light box views and all of that, you don't need an extra plugin. You have to do some research into the theme you chose and then go from there. Exactly, it will strongly depend on the theme you chose. The only one I was going to recommend is the exact same one you said, Next Gen Gallery is the one. Uh, honestly, I never tried any other than the one included in my builders, uh, so. I, I couldn't recommend any others than next gen. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Lorna, by the way, if you have any other questions, please use the Q&A so we, so we get them right on our screen when you ask. And um, Jody is also asking here, I use SmugMug because of their unlimited storage, but their templates aren't very flexible. That happens with most of these services, yeah. Uh, I can use a WordPress design with Smug, SmugMug hosting. I don't. Think you do? Can you? I, I I don't think you you can. Uh, no. From what I know, SmugMug is the same as uh, Photo Shelter. Both behave the same way. So you can have a hybrid website, basically a WordPress installation here and SmugMug or Photo Shelter here, and you can customize the template so they look the same, so it feels part of the same website, but it's it, they're two separate websites. Yeah. Exactly. So what I would what I would do in that case, Jody, is um, if you're not in love with SmugMug templates, which I don't like them myself, 
Um, what I would say is you can use your unlimited storage, like Alex was saying, just for your galleries. And that's it. Everything else you can keep a separate website. And if somebody wants to click on a gallery, just on the link, it'll take them to the Smagma part. That, that, exactly. should, that should work just fine. This is a one more thing about this. This is a common need for some photographers. They have a, a stock photography archive. They want to sell prints or stuff, but they want WordPress for a blog or something. So they need a hybrid website like that. They build all the static content in WordPress and then jump into SmugMug or PhotoShelter for the galleries. It's, it's normal. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about search database solution for landscape stock photographers where viewers need to be able to search for a specific location? Uh, I think we're talking about Ajax plugins here. I'm not sure. Alex, could you check this? Could you talk about searchable database solutions? I think we're talking um, about Ajax plugins, aren't we? If it's, if it's searching through WordPress media library, then yes, it's WordPress plugins, but she might be, Sue might be referring to platforms. Like you could build a, a, an archive of images and just search through image keywords or metadata. And most photography platforms have that. Uh, yeah. SmugMug, photo shoulders, they all have advanced search functionality. So you could research some of those platforms. It depends on your needs. What, yeah, what I would do, Sue, if, please let us know if we misunderstood your question. What I would say is um, you're talking about being able to search for a specific location. In that case, what I would do is we'll be adding all those images to a WordPress install. I use a plugin to sort them out by location. You can simply tag all these images based on their location. And, and it's, it's like a portfolio within WordPress. So what you do is when people search uh, go to the portfolio, they can just click through the different locations and they will only see the images from that particular place. But with, like, without further information, it will be tricky to, to yeah. keep, keep talking If about Sue that. is referring to something more technical, like searching through geodata, exif information in images, that's possible, but it gets very technical. You'd need to hire a developer for that. Yeah, that, that would be ideal. Um, give me one second. What makes some themes better for SEO? Let's talk about that in a little bit, um, in a few minutes, uh, Stephen. We'll keep that question right there. Major problem with Nextgen and their e-commerce, e says Blue Popovich. Um, the car is ridiculously small and they will not let you change neither the location or the page nor its size. If it's the purpose, the purpose or a good experience for customers. I haven't tried it myself, but I'm almost positive that you can fix that through CSS, right? Like he's complaining that the card is so small. I don't know, Blue, if you have any experience coding in CSS. If not, hiring a designer uh, or even a, a developer should solve the problem, but it's not a, um, not every platform is designed for every single solution. So if you're facing any issues, what I would say is just changing the CSS to make when, I, when you say the cart is ridiculously small, I don't, I'm not sure if you talk about the cart layout or the cart icon or, or the cart placement. What do you think, Alex? Um, maybe uh, they're referring to, you know, the interface in NextGen Gallery, if I remember correctly, uh, the cart opens on the right-hand side of the screen to the side of the image and it's just one column on the screen and maybe it's too restricted and- Too narrow. It's too narrow. It's, it's just a classic example of using a, a tool which is not that flexible. Uh, you could try to push it through custom CSS or hire a developer to do that, but it's, it's not easy. It might get complicated. You might just have to look elsewhere. It, it is how it is, unfortunately, sometimes. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just dealing with some questions here. Uh, what I would say is blue. Uh, I'm like, uh, like I said before, I would fix that through CSS. Uh, like almost all of those problems, if the card is too small or too narrow, it's just a, a couple CSS lines of code. It should be pretty simple. Feel free to reach out to either Alex or myself or myself after the webinar. And I, I know we'll, we can look into it in like a minute, Alex, and provide a solution, right? Yeah, sure. We should we should be able to help you that way, Blue. But um, but but I think that's it. It should be it should be fixable pretty quickly. 
I think Blue uh, wrote underneath. It's, oh, it's yeah, it's the icon, almost <laughs> yeah. invisible. It's, all, it's just CSS. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's fixable through CSS, but it can get complicated still, because if you make that icon larger, every, the entire toolbar needs to be larger. Some things might change. You need yeah. to hire a developer, it should be fixable. Yeah. Yeah, um, Blue, I, I honestly think it should be like like a super quick fix. But uh, again, without seeing it, feel free to send us an email. Either one of us will, will help you with that. Um, let's say SEO questions will come in a minute. I need help on content SEO design and code. Who will be able to hire for all of this? Well, Rahul, I'm going to say that myself because he's not going to sell you his services. That's what Alex does for a living. He, he helps people with design, coding, and all these things. So if you need help, Alex can definitely help you with that. If not, uh, if, if you can't afford the web design or anything, you, can, you will learn a lot today. But otherwise, or even still, I would reach out to Alex for that. I know, I know he can definitely help you with that. Uh, okay, so let's uh, keep. Cool, I think awesome. we, can, we can proceed yes. now. You... Uh, one more question came in just now. You mentioned gallery that is WooCommerce ready. Which one is it again, please? Yeah, it's NextGen. It's the one you mentioned. Next. Yeah, but NextGen gallery, but uh, WooCommerce is something else. That's a different WordPress plugin that it's not integrated with NextGen gallery. It's completely separate. They have separate e-commerce functionalities. Uh, there are plugins I know that do integrate with WooCommerce. Uh, I think um, there's one called Sunshine Photo Cart. You can Google that. I think it integrates with uh, WooCommerce, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if Enviro Gallery integrates with WooCommerce. That's another example. And also, you can just you use WooCommerce directly, the main plugin. It has a photography extension. So try that. Awesome. Okay, Blue, no worries. We'll, we'll stay in touch. Um, so, cool. I think we can continue, right? Yeah, let's continue. Um, okay, so we were yeah. talking about responsive websites. And um, I think if you could just go through the next slide. Yeah, the, the only yeah. small thing I wanted to add here is it's not just mobile friendliness, it's desktop friendliness, which not a lot of people talk about. Um, some people navigate a photography website on their desktop and they might have big desktop monitors. I know that photo buyers use big desktops. So if your target audience is photo buyers from editorial stuff or magazines and all of that, why not optimize your website for that as well? So whenever you have a gallery of thumbnails, take advantage of the whole width of the page uh, use your page builder, make it full width so you can fit more thumbnails per screen or make them larger. It's another way to improve the experience instead of having tiny thumbnails on a large desktop. Exactly. I'm, I'm using a 27 inch iMac and when I open websites that don't adapt, it's just awful. It's just, you need to just, just see a little part of your screen to, to be able to consume content, which nobody likes. Yeah. So uh, shall we go about, okay, yeah. Um, let's talk about website speed, guys. This is massive for everybody. For every, especially for the ones asking about SEO, this is tightly connected to your rankings and to how many people will actually find your website. And it's very important for the customer experience as well, okay? So um the slides here that alice is, is displaying they show just simple tools in which you can actually test the speed of your website you can use google speed insights there's also lighthouse which is a little bit more geared towards developers and then there are other websites like gt metrics which i strongly recommend okay mm -hmm. uh oh sorry i, I drove you yeah, crazy. no worries uh, GD metrics is the one you can see on the right side and then uh, page speed insights is the one on the left both of the websites will give you not only the the loading speed and the the ranking factors for your for your page but they will also tell you how to fix the problems you're having now some of these things are 
easier to fix than others, like image compression, text, sizes, uh, everything, image sizes, and all this stuff, and other things are a lot trickier, and you need either technical skills or hiring a developer. You're not gonna be able to get like a hundred percent rating on GT metrics, no matter how hard you try if you don't have the technical skills. Some things require paid plugins, some other ones require you to compress your images so much that you won't be able um, to actually improve the, the website as much as you would like. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the slides. Uh, WP Rocket is a caching, a caching plugin that we both use and love. Uh, I don't know about Alex, I only use it on one of my websites. I have like five websites, but I only use WP Rocket in one of mine. Do you use it in all of them? Uh, yeah, I started using it on all websites that I built just because I found it better than free plugins out there like W3 Total Cash. I think it's a powerful yeah, popular yeah. one. This one is a paid plugin. It's not free. It's inexpensive, but uh, it has it better features, better caching. Me. For everyone who wants it, it's about, I think it's about $40 for a single license. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, but I found it better and all the scores always went better, higher with, with this one. So I use it regularly now. I completely agree with you. Um, if you guys want to speed up your website, WP Rocket, we're not sponsored or any of that. We just recommend it because we both love it and we use it every single day. And you can actually see the, the page speed increasing and the rankings improving five minutes after you install it. Like it, you just click install and you will see some quick improvements. And then if you tweak it a little bit farther, you will get even better rankings. Yeah. Um, Besides having a caching plugin, I feel that since we're talking to photographers now, um, a big issue with performance is images. Uh, they really slow down websites sometimes. And if people are to take away something from now, it's these three topics. Number one is how to size your images because uh, too often photographers just upload high res images to, to websites and they're slow, they're not secure. Uh, I mean, in WordPress as well, someone can get a full res image from the source code, whatever plugins you use. So it's not safe and for performance, of course. My recommendations, we're talking about pixel dimensions because DPI, this is a common question I get, I have to address it. DPI yeah, is irrelevant for the web. DPI is only important when printing images. It's an instruction for printing, but if you're just showing images on a website, DPI is not relevant. What matters is pixel dimensions for images. So you just have to figure out how large the images need to be, how large they show up on the website. Uh, like in the first example, if it's a, a large full width slideshow, okay, you can go larger, like 2,500 pixels wide. If it's a gallery of thumbnails and you click on a thumbnail and it opens up in a light box view, you can make it medium sized, 1,500 pixels or 2,000 pixels on the long edge, whatever your preference is. And if you're, we're talking about a blog area, the image can be smaller, like measure how wide the blog area is, increase that by a bit so the images look crisp on retina screens, and that's it. Never upload high-res images to the website. Yeah, I agree completely. I usually, for blog, I would say 1,200 pixels is usually a good enough size unless your, your blog column is really tiny, then you can down, uh, lower that, but if not, usually anywhere between 11 to 1400 pixels wide for me, it's plenty to get nice detail. And uh, the images are lighter, they load faster, and clients love the experience because you just open a blog post and everything is loaded. You don't have to wait for like two minutes, no matter, especially if you're looking at your phone, you don't wanna wait for, for like a minute for, for a gallery to load, nobody likes that. And um, like, like you were saying, 25 pixels on the first example, it's even pretty big for me, but if you wanna keep it like that, you can even narrow down the, the top and the bottom so it's not like a massive thing that it's loading and it's not even displaying because unless you have a parallax effect, you will never see the full image. Mm -hmm. So you can just make it work on the dimensions that you're actually displaying. And guys, this is key. 
make sure that your images work in every device. Like if you use a massive image, you, you don't adapt it to smaller screens. It will look awful on a tablet or on your phone. And if you look, if you use smaller screens or something that just fills half of the screen, but then on your phone will take the full screen, then you need to make sure that it adapts and, and you actually show what you want to show, not just random parts of the image. Because if you lose the eagle in the middle picture, the image will make sense. Like you don't want to have just the horses in there or just the left rider. You want to have the most important part of the image to show on every device. Yeah, exactly. So be careful with image cropping when that happens. And because let's not forget the, the goal of all of this, which is performance. So we want to keep file sizes low so the pages load quickly. The number two factor is compression. So when you're preparing images on your computer, if you use Lightroom or Photoshop, when you figured out the pixel dimensions, then also lower the JPEG quality level. Don't go 100% because that creates huge file sizes and they load slow. Um, and you can tell the difference. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, if you go lower than 60, maybe you can yeah. start seeing some noise, but 60, 70, it's usually such a good ratio. You need to do some experiments. Yeah. Right, I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I think from like 81 to 100, we, don't, we can't tell the difference with a human eye. It's like the same thing, unless you're gonna print a big file, but for websites, like mm -hmm. 80 something to 100, it's the exact same image. So you're just increasing file size for no reason because nobody's gonna appreciate it and you're gonna make their, their connection struggle while looking at your website. So if you do these two things, like uh, good dimensions in pixels and a good compression level, you should get file sizes below 500 kilobytes or something like that. So they, they load fairly well. And you can then go and squeeze the file size even more by using some sort of plugin. And if you're using WordPress, um, I'm a big fan of ShortPixel. It's the one I'm currently using. It's a free plugin. They give you a, a free monthly quota. There are other ones out there, Smush or Imagify. You can test those out. And if you're not using uh, WordPress, you can compress the photos in something else before uploading them to the website. I think JPEG Mini is very popular with photographers. There are other tools. Yeah, I tried JPEG Mini and I love it. You can tell the difference. The images look exactly the same. File size is a lot smaller. It's also pretty affordable. It's not free, but uh, the best tools are usually affordable, not free. So I would say JPEG Mini is a great option. And um, there are some free plugins as well for WordPress. Uh, I, I tried Smash It and EWWW, e -W -W, I think you, you, you tried that mm -hmm. those as well. Uh, those work just fine. They are not that top of the game, but they work just fine. If, if, you, if you guys can't afford, I don't know, maybe $10, $20, $30 here and there, or you're just struggling because you're just bootstrapping a business and you don't have any income right now because of the situation, but you do want to build a great website, there are free tools that uh, feel free to ask in the q and if, if you don't know how to type anything. But like I said, uh, Smash It and EWWW, I think those are great image compressors as well. Uh, I was replying some questions. Did you talk about short pixel already? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mentioned it's one of my, my favorite plugins. And Mine too, I love it. Yeah, I, I like it if you're using WordPress. I like it because it's so easy to use in your workflow. You just upload the images to the media library and the plugin handles a lot of stuff. It compresses the images, it can create uh, next gen file formats, WebP that Google wants. It can resize large images to a smaller size so you don't, you avoid security problems. It can do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Um, just very brief, briefly to address a few things. Marcos recommended a platform that only works in Portuguese. So, Marcos, it's 46crowds.com. I don't know if it's going to be useful for other people, but if you guys want it, 46crowds.com. It's a good page builder for photographers. And then uh, Jody says that uh, her website looked great on the computer, but awful on your phone. Jody, like, like, like we said before, making it work on your phone is as, if not more important than making it look great on your screen. 
most people, when they don't know you, the first thing will do, they will do is just open your website on their phone. And if it looks bad, you just lost a client. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jody. We have a few questions on the comments as well. Uh, content and strategy side. Um, that's my area of expertise. I love that, Axel. We can and, and, go and through we'll cover that, that in, in some upcoming topics now. Exactly. Yeah. We're just trying to push the information because we have a lot of good information for you guys. So let's uh, keep going through the, through the website and, and we'll get to that in a little bit. SEO, content, uh, choosing a niche and clients. Alex. Um, cool. Uh, with, with SEO stuff, I think we can now start uh, touching on that a bit because we're... Exactly. we're starting to talk about text content. I mean, photography websites, okay, images are the main focus, but everything else uh, is text. And it's what Google understands on a website and it's what helps people navigate your website. So that all comes down to elements like all the image metadata stuff that you should add if you want that type of website. I'm referring to image captions, image keywords like in this screenshot or uh, gallery descriptions, gallery titles. Uh, all of those are text content that helps both people to get some context on what your photos are all about. It helps Google to help you rank for those words. It helps search functionality. Like in this case, there's a search gallery box there so people can search through images if you have a huge archive. All of that is image metadata and it's still critical. Exactly. And guys, uh, for everybody asking about SEO, these are the pillars of SEO for photographers. Uh, this is actually the biggest problem I see. And when Steven asked before, what makes some teams better for SEO? Well, all these things, being able to uh, not just show a portfolio with clickable images that they open in, 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 in a light box and you, and you can't do anything after that. You just wanna have a website that it's easy to navigate, a theme in your case, Steven, that you ask uh, a theme that it's easy to navigate and that when you press on an image, you can actually read a description. Because even though as photographers, we don't love to write about our photographs, if you guys want to start ranking, you need to add some text. The better the text, the better the experience for the user, the better the experience, the more people Google will send you, okay? So uh, like Alex was saying, metadata for images is the biggest thing, I see. alt text is the biggest thing I see missing on photography websites. And if you're missing that, you're missing on like the biggest thing you can do for SEO on your website. Also file names, your images shouldn't be named IMG slash 00072V edit. Yeah, slash. what does that mean? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's confusing for Google. It's confusing for everybody. So uh, make sure that your images say what you're talking about, who you are, what you do, or anything that relates to your business. If you wanna target a specific location, like you're a pet photographer in New York, you wanna include that, uh, if, if you, you, of course, if you're posting those kind of images on your website, you wanna include that as your file name, as your titles, as your alt text. And uh, something Alex told me uh, when we met is, hey, don't blast all of your images with the same alt text. <laughs> it's like, I love that. And guys, uh, you just try to, take put in the time and use proper alt tags and descriptions and everything for your for your images don't just upload everything and be done with it because we both know that we all know that blogging takes time but the better you do it the more clients you're gonna get and just to add one more thing to steven's question here um i've seen templates or themes that they look fancy, but they don't have good SEO. So that's where you need to do proper testing. I mean, the galleries look cool, but the images don't have alt tags. Or you do the SEO work in the admin area to add image metadata, right? Captions and keywords and image titles, but the theme doesn't use them on the front end. It simply ignores them. That's where a good theme comes into play and you do need to do some proper testing. Awesome. And all of this, uh, if we continue, all of this metadata also helps photographers who have a bigger um, archive of images 
and you put a prominent search box on your website, right? That's when all this metadata really shines because people can find your images based on keywords. You put keywords for uh, locations in your photos, for, for uh, people's names, for abstract meanings, for scientific names, all of that for people to find your images in, in a bigger stock archive. It's less relevant for a small portfolio website, but for a bigger archive, it's essential to use metadata. Cool. Any new relevant questions? Um, not so far. We, we shall uh, keep moving. Colty asks about the story, and uh, I want to address that in a moment uh, after you go through keeping the website alive. And, and this is key for SEO as well. This is all the SEO part, guys. So pay attention to this, and please ask as many things about the SEO as you want because we know both the soft side and the technical side. So uh, if we can help you somehow, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, keeping the website alive has to do now with returning visitors. We, we spoke about first time visitors to your website before, now returning visitors, and they are a different type of person, right? They already trust your website in a way, at least enough to come back to your website. And they're looking for something specific now. They know they can find it on your website, so they need to be able to get there quickly. But you also don't want to bore them. You, you want to provide some new and accurate content to them. So let's explore some ways to kind of freshen up your website. If you feel it's been gathering dust, uh, too many outdated photography websites out there. Number one, go and check the contact information on your website or anything else that's outdated. It happens too often. I've reviewed many photography websites and their phone numbers are no longer valid or the locations change and all of that. Make sure it's up to date. And then just bring some new life into the, into the galleries, into your homepage featured galleries, into your portfolio. Just move some things around, even if maybe, okay, pandemic, you didn't have new photo projects now, it's understandable, but why not rotate some of your past work, bring it up front just to make it interesting again. And it's, it's very important that as you're saying rotating, people don't actually know that you're rotating stuff unless they've been following you for a long time. You, you can always show that at, hey, this is what I'm up to these days. I've been shooting this, I've been shooting that. For example, when the pandemic started, I started sharing a lot of personal images and stuff that I had collecting for, I have been collecting for a while, but just showing people that I'm actually busy and up to something doing stuff that will show that you actually have a thriving business. Whether it's true or not, it's true for Google. If you show them that you're keep updating stuff and you keep showing your customers, hey, I've been doing this. This is a, this is a photo shoot that we've done. You don't have to say when. You, you don't have to say, hey, yeah, we ditched the, mother, the face mask today and we did this. No, you can share some, uh, some, a set of images that you actually shot like six months ago. It doesn't really matter. All you need to do is keep adding content to keep the, fresh, uh, the site fresh. And uh, well, adding content, don't forget to, as you share that, um, like I, I wanted to ask uh, Colty Hunter question. Sorry, uh, Colty, if I misspelling your name. Uh, what I want to say is he sells fine art, for example. Nobody cares when you produce the fine art. Nobody cares if you did it yesterday, when you were 14, or last year. All that matters is that it either is a gorgeous image or that it tells a story. That's, that's all that matters if you want to sell fine art. So um, some people might just get out of the way just saying, hey, this is what I do, and just showing an image, and you can interpret it your own way. Uh, Colty, if you actually have a story, definitely try to create some sort of website that people can actually go through your stories and not through your pictures. That's what I was trying to say before. You don't want to be the same as every other photographer because you actually have um, stories that you create. Most photographers, what they do is they show up, they shoot something, and there is a story, we're kind of documenting it. If you're selling fine art, in most cases, you're actually creating that story. It's not something that it's already there and you just want to snap a few pictures. 
Like if I go document a wedding, yeah, it's going to be my point of view, but that story is already happening, whether I take input on it or not. So in your particular case, try to showcase your story. You go through a website, you can blast your customers with your best story, something that actually draws your attention. And then instead of having a full navigation menu, you can have like a stories, contact or commission work or contribute or collab together, depending on, on the kind of, uh, depending on your goals for your website. If you wanna sell, you can just have stories, store and contact. And that might be it. You don't need to, uh, you can actually tell who you are through your stories if you want to. So you don't need to have all these sections. You can keep it as simple as you want, but always focusing on what your customers want, not what you want, okay? If your customers are into your stories, then get into your stories. If your customers just buy your stuff because it's pretty, then going through the pretty route might work for you. This is, I'm assuming you're trying to make money and not make art. If you wanna make art, then that's out of my league. I, I'm not just into the business just for making art. I'm into this because I love photography and I wanna make money out of it now that I've been in this for so many years. Hope that answers your question, Colty. Uh, Lionel asks, what um, WordPress SEO plugin you prefer and why, Alex? Well, I mostly use Yoast SEO, which is the most popular out there. Um, it's the standard, but I've been starting to experiment with Rank Math as well. I've, I heard it's really good, so I'm now juggling between the two and I'm, I'm testing them. But either one of them, you, you, you can't go wrong. Yeah. yeah, for me, it's always been Yoast SEO. The reason, Lionel, you ask why, the reason for me is very simple. It's always up to date. It's really updated. It keeps, Google makes a single change and they update their, 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 work, their, their plugin the next day. So that for me is key, uh, not just for safety reasons. They are keeping you up to date with how to fix your website. So if you install Yoast SEO, try to fill every single uh, fields you have in there and try to do it the right way and you will definitely see results if you, if you focus on that. Um, for niche photographers like mine as pet photographers, should I keep the images devoted to pet images and not add storage images of other topics? Um, Alex, I'm gonna, yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna tell her what I think and then you can contribute to mm -hmm. that if you want to. Julie, if you're a pet photographer, first of all, I, I love your niche. I've been thinking about just starting a business since we started this webinar about pets. And uh, let me tell you, you want to keep it, um, on, you want to have a focus. If your focus are pets, don't add images of everything else. Just focus on pets. But what's important about pets? You could, you could make it with a twist. Let's say you're the kind of person that believes Best look, pets looks like they're their owners. Then you can share pet galleries and then show the owner next to a picture that they look kind of similar to their pet. So then you have a twist. It's you're not just a pet photographer. You also find pets that look similar to their owners, and you have a just just a section for that on your website. So you can add stories in a unique way. You can find a different approach to a topic that might be boring for some people. Not for me and then uh, just add your stories through that way. You just share, hey, these are the cutest dogs we found last six months and we've been photographing them. And then if you wanna go and see stories, these are the owners. What are their names, what do they like, how old are they? You can, but stay into your niche and your clients will love you for it. Everybody loves that. Alex, and honey. I would just add um, a more website perspective into that. Uh, if, Julie, you're asking about combining pet photography with a different specialty on the same website, that's not really a good idea. Mm -hmm. I get this question a lot from photographers, whether they should merge different specialties on the same website or keep them separate. And most of the times is to keep them separate because that's how you can market your main website easier. It's focused on your audience. The only scenario maybe where you, you can keep them under the same roof if there's really an overlap in target audience. Let's say if you're a 
wedding photographer and you also put family portraits on the same website. Maybe that's okay because the audience is similar. Your wedding clients might also book you for some family portraits. But if you're trying to combine pet photography with architecture, because that's another one of your passions, they fight for attention and it's not a good idea. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, especially for SEO purposes, you want to be as targeted as possible. If you're a pet photographer, you're not only a pet photographer, you are the pet photographer in this small area in Vancouver, Canada. You don't want to be a pet photographer like most people are like, yeah, you're not just a pet photographer. You want to be the pet photographer in your city, in your town or whatever it is that you live, Julie. Uh, focus on that, lesser target your audience and you will definitely get results through your website. Um, thoughts on showing both commercial work and personal work on the same site. Um, I'm going to address this because it's pretty similar to what we just discussed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Igeri. Uh, what I would say is commercial work has a certain type of, type of clients that are not going to be interested in seeing your skateboarding pictures from the weekend. So. I don't know what you call personal work, but if it's related, you can somehow make it work. I, if, I've seen photographers just put personal projects near commercial projects, but they're in the same niche. If, exactly. if you're a commercial architecture photographer, but you also do personal architecture stuff, it's okay, but not something else. Exactly, unless it is tightly connected, I will definitely not include any personal work over there if you're trying to sell. Uh, if you're trying to sell, show your best work, like Alex said before, narrow down your portfolio. Nobody wants to see personal stuff that it's unrelated to what you do. Um, okay, Javier asks, uh, the fashion photography industry is not profitable at all. So even if that's the type of photography that Javier loves, um, he has to do other types of work to survive. So could he focus his web on fashion photos and then have categories in the portfolio that say food photography or something else? Uh, it's kind of the same thing. You're trying to combine different specialties on the same website. Uh, you won't really attract any audience because they'll come to your website. They'll see this. You everything. Yeah, this photographer is a jack of all trades. Okay, they have range, but they're not an expert on anything. So you have to, you have to pick and choose. If you're struggling uh, business-wise and you need to branch out to a different business, do it separately on a separate portfolio website and try to grow that, but don't put them together because they fight for attention and it doesn't help. Exactly. Javier, um, my quick answer is no don't do the don't do the subcategories don't do any of that uh focus on fashion if you want to make a living out of that if you're good there's money for uh for a handful of people maybe in in your area which i know it's not uh the best on the, uh, place on the planet to do that but uh there's definitely money if you're good enough if you're good enough you if you're in the top 10 people, I would say. But if not, I will keep that website just for fashion and start another website for food photography. And maybe you're the best food photographer in town and you will make a lot of money, which will allow you to continue with your fashion photography on the side. Okay. One last question for now. Coolty asks, um, how to find a good balance between words and images, I guess, in, in his stories that he mentioned earlier. And this has to do with blog posts as well, which is um, a normal way of saying the stories. There's no real answer here. It really depends what types of stories you're after. I mean, I've seen anywhere from uh, thousands of words of text just for one image, the shot, how you shot it, why and what you overcame versus one paragraph of text here and a few galleries of images and so forth. It really depends. Don't worry about SEO for this one. Just make the story as interesting as possible to human readers and then Google will be happy as well. Exactly. Humans focus on what they want to read from you. 
Um, Jody asks, if you want our photos and website to show on Google search, yes, we do, Jody. And um, do we have to have meaningful descriptions, H tags on each photo? No, and I thought I had metadata in my photo on SmackBack, but it doesn't show out in photo details. Okay, so um, first of all, H tags do not belong to images, okay? H tags are a part of SEO that belongs to text. So to, to the have, page itself, yeah. Exactly. If you have a title, that's an H1 tag. If you have a, a subtitle, that's an H2 tag. And then you can use H3, H4 for different purposes. But uh, nothing else than that. So H tags are definitely a no for images. That's for everybody, guys. Uh, don't mess up with H tags unless you're writing content for your blog, but no, not for your images. Uh, meaningful descriptions. Uh, yeah, Alex, do you want to... Uh, yeah. Tell her about alt text. I think that's, that's what uh, she's asking about. Maybe, yeah, she might be referring to image alt text, which of course is useful for SEO. It takes, it takes time to write them and to not do a copy paste job to write them uniquely. If you have time, do it. Uh, it helps with SEO. Uh, if by descriptions, Jody, you're referring to gallery descriptions, like some sort of introductory paragraph on a gallery page, that helps too. Any text helps Google and people get more context what the website is all about. There's always a trade-off of time and effort, but, but it works. It helps. It's one extra factor. Yeah. It works. Uh, I mean, we both make money that way, so it works and we make it good living uh, and we spend enough time writing our text and everything. So yes, uh, take the time and do it. It definitely works. Um, okay, Daryl Walker, hey team, links. How do we go about building external links to a fresh brand new website? That's a marketing question, which I love. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's the right moment to answer that or if we can continue let's, and go. Let's keep this for, for the yes. end, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, Daryl, so we can actually focus on a little bit of the website for now, and I'll definitely uh, answer your question in a, in a little while. So let's, yeah, let's move on to the next topic, which is about your, your bio page and your contact information and how that's critically important for your website. And, uh, Gaston, you yeah. work a lot with photographers and the concept of elevator pitch sounds businessy and not many people like it, but I know its importance and I know how people can leverage it on their website. How do you feel about it? It is. It is definitely salesy. And guys, it is salesy because I do sell. I do sell a lot. Like I focus uh, half of my business, I would say, is photography. The other half is selling and that's why I make uh, such a good living because I can actually decide who to work with, how many weddings do I want to book and all this stuff. So uh, first of all, your photographer bio, I'm sure we both have an input on this. Um, keep it interesting, short, sweet, without going like deeply personal because I don't know if people are really interested in that, but try to make something enjoyable for a reader. Let's pretend you are uh, they have no idea who you are. How can you describe yourself in a way that it will make you either more attractive or they will be saying like, no, this person is not for me. That's what you want to do. Uh, when you're selling, and this is where the elevator pitch comes into place. When you're selling, what you're trying to do is you're trying to address a group of people and exclude every single person that is not a part of that group. Okay. So, uh, what I'm trying to go here with the elevator pitch is who do you serve, why, how, and who do you not serve, okay? So um, in a simple way, just to, to address this, for me, it will be, in my case, it will be I'm a wedding photographer for, for couples who are not uh, comfortable in front of the camera, okay? I, I am great at working with people that don't, feel any confident in front of the camera. I don't work with models, I don't work with anybody else. So what happens with that statement? If you are kind of an influencer or if you are like this really hot couple and I'm not your guy, like 
that's that's not my target audience and i love to be shooting people that look amazing but that's not what i'm selling so i might uh, i might get some kind of different customers and these could be addressed for any of you guys so uh for example let's say um it's not a secret that i have tattoos in half of my body so i could address tattooed couples for example so if i start showing pictures of myself displaying my tattoos i could be working towards um chest not not chest but these edgy couples that look different people that like tattoos people that are very trendy more hipster like so what i would say is focus on who can you help and who can you not or who do you want to help okay you have to think of your ideal client and then the elevator pitch is because you know when you walk into an elevator and there's like that awkward silence we all been there right exactly. <laughs> you know yeah. you know what i'm talking about you just walk and it's like somebody over there and if you kind of know them it's like hey what do you do for a living and, and then, then you paralyze <laughs> and then you have yeah and it's like uh, well i I'm a photographer and, and that's that's all you said and maybe they are looking for a photographer but they don't know what you do so you could say um i'm a pet photographer just paraphrasing a, a couple of questions that we had ago i'm a pet photographer for couples who consider their dog a family member okay so you are excluding like millions of people but the ones who love their dog so much that, that they they would they have them on their bed every night while they'll sleep they will hire you because you you have an immediate connection with them and that's just an example of a questions we have before but it could be related to anybody i could be uh geared towards uh, realtors who want to step up their game and sell like these millionaire homes instead of just shooting cheap places for like 50 bucks you don't want to you don't want to be that guy unless you work by volume but if not your elevator pitch is all about saying who you work who you serve how you serve them and who you are not okay so uh try to keep it like you should be able to say it in like 10 seconds like the time that the elevator takes <laughs> to go two levels up that's it so i think it's very important if you can sort of place that somehow on your website in a web that in a way that when people see that in your bio or they understand who you are they will be like yeah this is my guy or yeah i don't i, I don't connect with this guy you don't want to write like i don't know 20 sentences of nonsense you want to connect with people so you need to establish a connection and this is a great way yeah that that was excellent uh two things to add here and we haven't spoken in advance about this but i i kind of feel exactly the same thing way that you you said it there's um a nice strategy of writing this elevator pitch that i i saw on a business consultant his name is jonathan stark i follow his podcast and he mentioned this phrase which i'm going to post now in the chat to help people write that i'm a specialty who helps target audience with yes. the problem or service unlike the alternatives and then give give them reasons why you're unique so this if you fill this in it kind of covers what uh what you said gaston uh or who you help why you help and who you don't help exactly that that particular phrase that you use is the one i have on my instagram if you go to my instagram it's like yeah. uh I'm a coach. I help wedding photographers build profitable businesses without wasting money on ads because that's what exactly. people do. So, so you you, me, you mentioned a differentiating factor there, how you're yes. unique. Yeah, exactly. For me, it's all about, hey, I can help you grow your business without spending $5,000 on ads because I, I barely do any ads. I do them, but, but very little compared to the amount of work I get. So for me, the differentiation part is like, I'm not going to ask you to hey, yeah put all this money on ads and you have a successful business because it is a way but it's not my way so so i think that that sentence you were over there will help a lot of our viewers our audience to understand how to craft their own elevator pitch that's a great cool. yeah and 
since I work on a lot of photography websites, I know how this phrase, if you can define it for your business, you can then use it in a lot of places on your website, in marketing materials, on social media, like you said, in brochures. You can put it on your homepage, right in a small, in a tagline somewhere, uh, in your about page. You can really leverage it in a, in a lot of places. So it's really useful to nail it down. Okay, cool. so I was um, I was just reading through the questions as you were saying that last piece. Um, how should the elevator pitch translate for fine art photographers? Stephen, that's that's actually a great question. To be honest, I don't know exactly what you do. Fine art is such a vast word. I don't know if Alex, if you have any inputs on this, if you if you Alex, if you Stephen want to clarify that a little bit for us. Uh, fine art is, is a massive uh, topic. So I don't know if you need an elevator pitch. This, this is something that could help you, but I honestly don't know if you need one, but depending on what you do. Uh, if you're the you kind might of- need to specialize further. Exactly. Fine art photography is too vast. Exactly. If you're the kind of person that goes, for example, wakes up at 4 a.m. to go to the beach and do like a 30 minute long exposure of the ocean, just hitting the same rock over and over and over again. And, you, and you're selling that, then your, your elevator pitch will be so drastically different than if you do digital art, which is for some people consider as well fine art, which is absolutely different words. So we will have to see exactly what you do, Stephen, and we might be able to help. If you want towards the end of the webinar, we can focus on your, on your particular situation. And Kulti uh, is asking us again about uh, stories on his website and how to balance words and images. Um, I think we already addressed this a bit. Kulti, uh, I really invite you to email us, uh, either of us, and send us a link to your website so we can take exactly. a closer look. Uh, it's hard for us to know what you mean by story and what type of uh, work you do and what would be most appropriate. So send us an email and we'll be happy to take a look and give you some more specific suggestions. Yeah, completely agree. Um, cool. Okay. I think we can, yeah, move forward. And do um, you want to talk about this, Alex? Yeah, sure. This is a, um, a bit more technical. We're talking about the contact page. It's usually the most important place on your website that people need to reach. Of course, the homepage is more important, but this is the destination. Um, a few guidelines here. If you have a contact form, which I think you should, keep it as simple as possible, as fewer fields as possible. Uh, if you ask for extra fields like your phone number or your location or something else, you'll just lose people. They won't leave you a message. Keep it as simple as possible. Have an email address too. Some people prefer to send you an email using their personal Gmail account and not use the form. Have that as well, make it clickable so it's a link. Um, if your location matters, if you target an audience in a specific area, uh, mention your location there because it's the one place buyers go to to know where you're from. Um, yeah. yeah, what I would say is just like you, like you mentioned before, ask anything that you need and nothing else than that. I've seen wedding photographers asking couples on their contact form, how did you meet? And it's like, if you ask me how I met my significant other in a website form before we ever talk to each other and I need to sit down and write that, I'll, I'll be like, uh, yeah, I'll do this later. I'm not going to send you an email. Like you just lost me there. It's just, you don't need to know how I met my partner the first time we talked to each other. So, so I would say, Ask only what you need and everything else. You can ask it on the second email. You can, you can ask 50 questions if you want to, but not on the form. Draw, draw people in, make them make the first uh, contact with you, uh, open the communication, and then your conversions will also improve. But if you're blocking them right from your contact form, it's, it's a lost opportunity, I think. Yeah. 
Uh, cool. Some other suggestions here would be just to uh, put contact as the last menu item in the navigation menu. That's where people expect it to be. Um, and sometimes I, I saw photographers put their email and maybe their phone number too in the site footer. So it's available throughout their website. That's that works, a good idea. Yeah. It's yeah. easy to find. Um, yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, I think this is super clear. Cool. Uh, one last thing uh, we should address, I think, on this topic of uh, how people get in touch with you is call to action buttons. Uh, I don't know if all the photographers watching this know what they are. They are basically buttons at the end of pages linking to a different page, basically. Um, and it's just a way to encourage people to navigate through your website in a certain flow. So they start off like in, in this graphic here, people start off on your homepage. And then what's your goal? You want them to go to your contact page, but should they go there straight away? No, because they don't trust you yet. So figure it out. Maybe you want them to explore your services a bit or read about your bio or things like that and create a flow through your website using these buttons, this, these links. And I, I've noticed photographers implementing this, they've really increased their inquiries and contact messages. Yeah, this is for everyone. Um, we have a lot of people joined uh, to the webinar and this is not the exact same for everybody. If your website is a store and you want people to buy things, the CTAs or the call to actions should take them to that store. Like everywhere they go, they should be addressed. They should be guided to that store. If you, are, uh, if you need them to reach out to you, then it will be the contact button. Okay, so make sure that you understand what, you, what your goal is and your website should make it very clear for them on what to do next. Exactly, cool. Next topic, um, email marketing. Uh, not many photographers do this uh, and they should. You know, there's the, the expression, uh, the best time to start a newsletter is yesterday. Uh, it's so effective for marketing and it's a tool that not many photographers leverage. And I try to ask myself why. And I think two common hurdles. Number one is it's a bit technical sometimes, even if services like uh, ConvertKit or MailChimp, they're, they're straightforward, but there's still a bit of complexity and not all photographers are tech, tech savvy that way. And also the, the second hurdle, they don't know what to write about. It's the same as with blogging. What, should, what email should I send? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't use uh, email marketing on my photography website um, because I have only one-time customers and I never found a reason to uh, email them every two weeks or every month, but I do, use it on, I do use it on my other businesses and it works great. So what I would say is, especially we had a couple of questions from pet photographers, um, real estate photographers, fine art. If you sell fine art, having an email list, it would really help you because all you need is to educate your customers until they buy from you. So if you're selling fine art, it's amazing. You can uh, show the backstories of your images. You can show your process. You can show how a, a simple image becomes a piece of art. You can tell them how to frame, where to display your art. So there's a ton of things you could do for every business that you could leverage uh, email marketing. And uh, if you if you want to go to the next slide, Alex, exactly. So uh, the best thing to do this, guys, is to start implementing it on your website. Um, add these options for everybody to get news from you. If they want to learn more about your process or about anything, you can simply ask them, hey, would you like to get more information from me? Would you like to, uh, or even if they are previous customers, if you email previous customers, your chances of getting sales are a lot higher than just going out for new customers because they already know you, they know the quality of your work, 
and you already spent all that money trying to get them in the first place, either ads or content creation or emails or whatever it was the first time, they already know you're good at what you do. So if you shoot bets, for example, in certain times of the year, like start of the spring, you see that it's a great moment to get the pets outdoors and get some great images. Just offer like mini sessions. Hey, bring your pet for 15 minutes and you will get a, like, I don't know, five prints. And you just can book people back to back. And, and in a single morning, you can make $2,000 if you're good at it, if you have a strong email list. So start building one if, if you can, because it's very useful. Yeah, um, I completely agree. Um... I still imagine photographers uh, watching this, they're struggling to come up with ideas, what to write about, and it really doesn't have to be complicated. They can, they don't need to be a writer. Uh, they can just repurpose content that they already have on the website. They, they can talk about their services. If they have an FAQ page, they can put parts of that into an email or just show recent projects or things like that. It, it's really not complicated. And then once you start a list, there are tools and plugins that you can use to put subscribe boxes or pop-ups on your website. Of course, we're not advocating intrusive, annoying pop-ups. You can make them more discreet. There are ways to do that, like after a certain delay or after people scroll down a page or exit in 10 pop-ups, Google what that means, uh, just to not bombard people with annoying pop-ups. And then just start sending the first few emails, start scheduling a few more and you, you get it into a habit and it really grows and it can help you. If you do this right, you will definitely, there's no way you cannot make money out of email marketing. You just need to start building that list because you're not going to get clients if you have five people on your list. But once you have a couple hundreds, you just send an email and you're selling. You're just selling stuff. So it works. It works great every time. Yeah. And then we move on quickly to the topic of social media and paid ad advertising, which is kind of another set of tools that you can use to grow your business and get more traffic. Um, I don't know, uh, Gaston, what your opinion is of social yeah. media sites. I me, tried, go ahead. I, I tried everything that you have in there, but Twitter. I never ran Twitter ads. My clients are not in there, but everything else I've done it. I've run. But, but besides ads, what about the use of social media sites in general? Well, I use, it, I use them every single day. I see a huge benefit from it. And um, most of my photography uh, clients come from SEO a lot more than paid advertising, but I do advertise um, not as much as I should, but honestly, besides the pandemic, I'm always like fully booked. So that's why I don't spend money on ads. Like every time I'm, I'm buried in work, I'm thankful for that. So what I, what I always do is I just build a lot of, uh, I built a huge platform for my clients and when they go there, they actually get a lot of value and education and stuff like that. So they keep coming back to me and they love it. They actually love the experience. That's what I'm best at. But um, I think that a lot of businesses uh, would see a huge benefit if they learn how to use ads. Uh, for all the photographers that we have today, um, if you can target your audience, uh, I, I I don't know which kind of photography you guys want me to talk about. Feel free to write that in the chat. Uh, I know we have some real estate, um, pet photographers, fine art, wedding photographers. What kind of uh, niche would you like me to talk about so I don't keep coming back to the same examples? But um, I tried a lot of Google PPC, Google Ads. Uh, that's the one I use the most, but it's not uh, the cheapest one. So I would say if you... If you're looking uh, to learn ads, I would start with Facebook ads. And when I say Facebook, Facebook, it's, it's not just Facebook. You know, Facebook, it's Facebook, Instagram, stories, and every single thing you see on social media these days, besides TikTok, uh, you can promote it. So uh, Facebook has a huge platform and it's fairly cheap. It depends on your goal, guys. I'm not gonna go really in depth about ads unless you want me to, feel free to ask any questions, but 
if you have a new brand, if you have a new website, like one of those questions we had before, what you want to do is you want to build awareness. You want to let people know that this is what you do, that this is the area you work in, and they, you, you are the go person, the go-to person for them. So try to create awareness first. Remember what we said before. If you want to sell something, you don't just meet someone and ask them to marry you. You start talking to them, you start talking to them again, you keep giving them value, and when they see the value, they come to you when they need to purchase anything, okay? And, so, and showing up in front of people multiple times, repeatedly, exactly. that's how you build trust, and social media is just one tool to do that. Exactly, in Facebook, I think it takes, uh, there's a, there are some statistics, I think it takes someone like seven times to see you before they buy. So, so it's like, if you're running ads for like $50, guys, nobody's gonna see you. So if you're getting serious into ads, you need to spend quite a bit of money. I'm talking anything over $300 just to feed your Facebook pixels information. And once you fed that pixel, you can start retargeting those customers, okay? So you need to put a lot of money to create awareness first and once that Facebook pixel gets enough information and they see who's clicking on your stuff, you can actually go and sell to them, okay? So it's a long process. I wouldn't recommend you to use ads if you're planning on spending 10, 50, or 100 bucks. Don't even try it. There are a lot other methods that will work a lot better than ads. Uh, if you wanna find someone and, and say, hey, buy from me, then Google ads is the way to go because uh, some Google searches have buying intent. Depending on what people buy, you can determine whether they are looking for it from, sorry, depending on what people search, you can tell whether they're looking for information or whether they wanna buy. If, if, you, if you say uh, dog photographer in Punta Cana, that's where I am based at. If you say dog photographer in Punta Cana, it's very likely that you wanna take pictures of your dog. But then if you type uh, how to groom my dog for a photo shoot, then you're not looking to hire a photographer. So once you start learning all these terms, you can be very successful at Google Ads. But I have to warn you, it will take you a couple thousand dollars to learn that if you don't have the experience. So hire someone or go get training before you spend any money on it. If you have the technical skills, go ahead and start testing, but it's gonna take you a while. So I will be very cautious on the way you approach this. I agree. It's uh, from limited knowledge I have on this. Yeah. It's powerful, it's fast, but you can burn money very quickly very on it. Quickly. Yeah. And this kind of leads us well into our next and final topic. How do you make ads more effective? It's by doing proper marketing and targeting your ads to the right audience. Um, so maybe let's talk a bit about that, about how back to the concept we started, how the industry is saturated, how everyone is struggling to find new clients and everyone's you know, trying to lower their prices to try to get more clients, the race to the bottom. It's, it's not a good situation for many photographers. And um, by the way, I thought I'd share a, a story with you uh, about wedding photographers. I think we have a few in our audience today. Um, when yeah. I got married a couple of years ago, we hired some really good photographers, some respected photographers in, in our city. Yeah. And the photos turned out awesome. And when we show them to family and friends, every single time, the first thing they asked about is how much did it cost? So pricing was the number one thing on people's minds every yeah. single time which just means which just shows right how the wedding photography industry is so saturated and how how can you differentiate yourself from other wedding photographers if everyone's just looking at costs you have to figure out a way to be different i agree and being different is a key word here you don't uh want to market to everybody because if you start just saying hey i'm a wedding photographer 
it's like okay let, let's compare and you you in every city you can find at least 20 30 wedding photographers so how will you compare if you don't have the experience if you don't have the talent if you don't have the amazing portfolio from many years of doing this because some of you maybe have been working like myself in the, in the business in the industry for like 10 years and then i could start a hundred websites and i will build a hundred different portfolios with just different demographics i could grab uh, people that look like in a certain way, uh, couples that look um, different, thinner people, overweight people, redhead people, tattooed people. I, I, I would just have all these different groups that I could approach. But if you start that way, if, that would, if that's what you do at the beginning, you're only competing either for price or social proof because people want to know that they're making the right decision. So... If you compete against me, for example, I had I had a lot of now that I don't know how many competitors I have in the in the, in the audience. I have a lot of people copying everything I was doing for years, and when they were comparing, it's like I have like 400 five star reviews in my photography business. How can you compete if you just started like a month ago? You have like seven reviews. Your portfolio is extremely limited. You have to differentiate yourself. And that's how you get clients. Differentiating could be either uh, targeting different groups of people. And just so I don't talk specifically about uh, the wedding industry, it could be either like demographics, like, hey, I'm going to talk about, um, I don't know, people that are in this uh, range, in this age range, people that have this level of income or studies or it's, it's very common to see these um, photographers working in these amazing millionaire homes. Like, like if you're a photographer in California, there's like, like a luxury market that you could just target them. And that will make you different. You wouldn't be competing for price anymore because if you're a real, a real estate photographer and you're shooting $5 million homes, you're not charging $100 to go and shoot that. You're charging for your expertise. So... How would they know that you're an expert? Well, you differentiate yourself, you educate your customers, you compare your images to other photographers out there without bashing on anyone. You could just say, hey, if you're looking to sell a house, this is what you need to pay attention to. This is what my images look like versus what half of the images in real estate look like, which is crap because most photographers take similar pictures but if you sit down and edit for an hour, your images will look different than if you sit down and edit for two minutes. So that could be your differentiator. Another one could be your pricing. There's nothing wrong in differentiating yourself in pricing. You can be the cheaper one in your area, which is not wrong, but I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. Or you can go premium pricing. It's like, okay, everybody's charging $1,000. I'm going to charge $6,000. And it works because... Yeah. If you're comparing and it's like, hey, all these photographers look the same and they all charge between one and $2,000. And I love this guy, but he charges 6,000. And then the conversation is like, can we afford him? Is it worth it? And, and that just puts something in your mind that, yeah, this guy is different. Why? Yeah. Well, you have to back that up with great images, great customer service, you have to find a lot of different ways to differentiate yourself. Do you have a different approach or something you want to add to this? Uh, I, I completely agree. And uh, pricing is definitely a way to position yourself. Like you said, um, I know photographers who just decided to double their prices or increase them by 50% overnight. And they got success from it just because people saw them more as an expert. And like you said, of course, you need to have the the images to back that up. The quality needs to be there, otherwise you lose trust. But if you do, it's a good instrument to, to do that. Um, exactly. Just a bit, go yeah. ahead. So um, I wanted to touch more on this topic of choosing a narrower niche for yourself and how that usually helps. And I tried before, before this event to come up with some examples that I know from past clients who try to transition um, as a niche. 
And maybe I can post them here in the chat just so people can see a few examples. And maybe you can comment on them because you, you haven't seen them before. Let's see. Point These are range. past clients who actually made this change. And there's actually an example there as well. And they were successful with it. Yeah, this is great. I mean, uh, family photography, that's, if, if you live in a small town, that might be enough, like family photographer. Mm -hmm. But if you live in a huge city, how many family photographers are you competing with? Like there, there may be hundreds. And, and like I was saying before, these days, anyone can grab a camera and just sell family photos because it's relatively easy to get into it. Like I'm not saying getting great images is easy, but starting a business as a family photographer, you could really do that with like, 200 bucks and, and just run a promotion and you will be getting clients in, in like a month. It's, it's fairly easy. Like it doesn't matter where you are. If you know how to do it in like a month or two, you should be able to get clients. So uh, if, you, if you're in a big city, for example, moving to the LGBTQ community, that's massive because the community is a segment that is small enough, but once you get one or two clients, if you're good, they'll talk to each other about it. And they'll start calling you and it's like, hey, I met this photographer, he only works with our community. He only works with these, these and these and these and these groups. So you, are the, the, you, you have the specialty, you are the go-to person for that tight, small community. And the good part is communities talk, in, in communities, people talk to one another. Like, you might feel like the audience is smaller, the yeah. market is smaller, but word of mouth, marketing, all that happens much better. Exactly. And when they need someone, they're going to hire you. They're not going to hire someone who has someone. If you go to my website, I have some same sex couples, but most of them are brides and grooms. If you go to another website and it's all same sex couples, you'll end up hiring that guy. I'm sure you will because it, it gives you trust, authority, and they the, their messaging is going to be addressed towards the same sex couple. And uh, of course, this is just an example, but still like photos to only doing commercial work, luxury watch to jewel and jewelry rents. That, that's amazing. Like, it's yeah. Just... And he got eventually got a project, a commercial project for Rolex. So it works. <laughs> it, it definitely works. It definitely works. Uh, generic wedding photography to super fun wedding photography. Well, I'm going to you... check. You can check out that website. It's, it's amazing. I, I just found it online recently. It's so niche down and the entire website, this is a cohesive, fun design that matches the brand. Exactly. Yeah. That's a really good example. Yeah. I, well, I love it. You just go into the website. If, if you guys are in the chat and you want to see that, just go in the website and it's all colors and people having fun and doing crazy faces. If you're that kind of couple, I will hire myself. I will hire that guy. Like, like it's like, you're, you're really good at that. So um, if, if you're trying to just narrow down your niche, think of in which specific way, if you're targeting everybody, just try to, if, if you're African-American, you can work with the African-American community. If, if you have a strong link with them, if you're, I don't know, um, there are so many ways uh, that we were talking the other day, Alex, and it's what I was saying is um, niching down. You could be the family photographer or you could be the maternity photographer, which is not the same thing. Like you're still shooting families, but you have a strong focus. And if, if there's a pregnant woman considering hiring someone and all they see is pregnant woman on your portfolio, you have like a much higher chance of being hired or getting the job. So uh, anything that you can just luster target a specific audience, it will help you a lot. It will help you uh, like a lot. Even if you think like the market is smaller, like you were saying before, you could just make it broader later on if you decide, hey, I'm not getting enough customers or you can either even launch like a sub brand, like a secondary brand and saying, hey, I'm this um, real estate photographer for like these millionaire homes, like I was saying, but 
I'm also shooting these uh, conservation projects or these uh, restorated factories. And if somebody's into like building, uh, I don't know the, the, the word in English for that, sorry, but if you're building like a massive um, building just, just to construct things inside, they're gonna hire you because you're targeting that specific um, client and not just everybody. You, you, wanna, you wanna focus on, on a single person. That's what I'm trying to say here. I got lost in, in finding yeah, the word for no that, but I couldn't find it. Do you guys have any questions? I see that a lot of you held for such a long time. So thank you for joining yeah. us. Um, do you have any questions? Because I want to answer the ones that we have pending in here. And uh, let me see how many. Okay. So um, Daryl Walker, Daryl, I hope you're still in there. I know we make you wait like 30 minutes. So uh, how do you go about building external links to a friend, to a fresh brand new website? Um, Daryl, I'm assuming it's a photography website, but I don't know which kind it is. I should, I know I should have asked before. If you're in there, please uh, specify which, yeah, you're, you're connected. So please let me know which kind of photography website it is. Wedding sites, fantastic. Daryl, have a lot of ideas for you. That's what I do for a living. So um, first of all, it's a brand new website. Do you have a portfolio? Did you shoot? Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for sticking so long with us. Uh, Daryl, do you have a portfolio? Do you already have past clients? Have you met people in your industry or is it all new for you? Because um, if we have any other photographers in the audience, which I can recognize a few names, so I know we do. Uh, guys, first of all, you're not like an individual in a massive industry that you're not connected to anyone. What you should do is start building those connections. So first of all, as wedding photographers, we work with a um, couple of years worth of images. Awesome. As wedding photographers, we work with vendors every single day. We work with venues, we work with makeup artists, we work with florists, we work with a uh, uh, fire shows, crazy hour shows, everything that is a part of your wedding um, team, even the caterers, the people offering food at your events, Daryl, if you took pictures of their food, send it to them and tell them, hey, here are some free images of our last gig together. If you share those, please make sure that you link here and there, okay? It could work for Instagram, it could work for your website. Getting links shouldn't be as hard once you start. Uh, awesome, thank you, Jim. Once you start building those that portfolio, getting links should be fairly easy. You just need to reach out to everyone that was a part of building those images. If uh, let's say the bride choose a $5,000 dress because brides do that. So I actually see the price tags sometimes when I'm shooting, I have to get rid of the price tags and it's like, okay, it's a $5,000 dress. You can simply ask them, hey, who did you get this dress from? Do you mind if I share my images with them? And uh, you can simply tell them, look, this is the, this, I took these images on my last event. I know this dress is yours. If you like to share it, you don't need to pay me anything. I will just say, hey, Please, if you share these images, post this and link this website. So there are so many ways, Daryl, you can reach out to vendors. If none of that works for you, for whatever the reason, reach out to venues. Why not? Like, like if you have a couple of years taking pictures, weddings, I'm sure you work at several venues. Give them free images for their website. It's like, hey guys, I know we work together. I shot like six events at your venue last year. Take these images. Do you, all I ask in return is that you link to my website. And I'm sure that if your images are good enough, not only they will link to your website, they will also thank you and share that on their Instagram, social media stories. And when new brides go and book that venue, they'll see your images, not only your images, they will see your work. So they will, they will see that you worked there before, you have the expertise, you know the area, you know the lighting. That's what couples care about. If, if you have the, the authority to sell your services, they even pay extra. 
uh, I hope that kind of answers the question. I don't know if you, Alex, want to say anything else about building external links to a brand new website. That's, that's good. And that's a clean kind of organic approach to, to gain links over time. We're not talking about any dark tactics. We're not talking about buying links. We're because not we know about, all of those as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So go for clean stuff, links that you gain organically over time, places where you can control, like put your links in social media sites. Some photographers are members of associations, contests, uh, memberships, put your link there. But other than that, just wait for it to grow over time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Focus on the good stuff, not on the shady links that you can buy. Don't, don't waste your money and, and most of all, don't ruin your reputation. Um, before we cover all the remaining questions and we invite people to send any other questions now in the Q&A, uh, why don't we also tell people what they can get uh, yeah. from us yeah. on their website so we don't forget? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I was, I was forgetting. Guys, uh, we have a ton of resources for photographers in both of our websites. Uh, if you go to my website, it will ask you for the link. But if you type this on your browser, uh, you will get all these resources without typing anything. Just type that on your browser. And I wrote a ton of stuff on targeting your ideal clients, getting them to your blog, simplifying your marketing, because I know photographers struggle with SEO and marketing. And once you find the right tools, which they're all super affordable, nothing costs like $100 a month or anything like that. It's all much, much cheaper than that. So all these tools will help you like jumpstart your business right away. So it's growwithgaston.com. That's my website. I, I, put the, I put the link in the chat. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I moved everything. So that will help you get a lot of free resources. And Alex, you want to tell them about your stuff? Yeah, this is the link for me. Let me copy paste it into the chat so you can find it easily. It's as you can see, we're not selling anything. It's just free resources that you can get. I have on this page some free uh, eBooks and guides for SEO and all of that and a small discount for any other courses or services that I have. So feel free to check out our websites to get the free stuff and get in touch with us for more information. Now, let's end with Q&A. Yeah, I wanna address something. Um, sure. Bile Nahan, I think it's, sorry if I misspell your name, guys. Uh, I wanna address something that, um, that he or she said. Uh, he said, never give an image away for free without receiving something in return. It cheapens the industry. Barter, sell, or exchange for something of value. Here's my personal opinion. Uh, if you're getting links in return, you're getting visitors and you're getting clients. It strengthens your authority and your reputation. And uh, let's shift the perspective here and think about it for a moment. Alex and myself, are giving a lot of stuff for free today. Not only knowledge, but we're also giving you resources, like for free. We're not pushing you to buy anything or, or just asking you to just give us your credit card for whatever the reason. So we actually believe in exchanging information, helping each other. It's, a, it's, it's always a community. So if you get links in return and they are getting images of, the, of their work, I think you are getting something in return, okay? You, it, it not always means money because let's say an approach a makeup artist and I tell her, hey, give me $50 for, uh, give me $50 for, uh, for the images of our last event. And she'll be like, yeah, sure, why not? Where do I send that money? Yeah, this is $50. And she's not tagging me later because I did that or I don't have a contract that forces her to tag me or any of that. Then I'm losing a potential list of customers that will be happy to pay me $3,000 for one day of shooting for me. That's if I charge that for photography, I would rather get one single $3,000 customer than getting $50 or $200 from a makeup artist. And not only that, if they have a, a, a good website and they're actually getting visitors, that's free links for life. 
you're getting free leads, but free customers for life. So uh, that's my approach to that. I don't know if you, Alex, disagree with me or you think. Um, no, I, I, I agree with that. And Bill, um, I get where you're coming from. Free stuff, it, it feels like it cheapens the industry and it's not a good idea. And maybe you're also thinking of the micro stock photography industry, selling images for $1 or $5. Definitely, we're not for that. But yeah. offering sometimes offering a free or maybe i'm going in a different direction but offering a free photo shoot to uh, increase trust and then get hired for a, um, a more expensive project is a tool you can use or offering people a free image as a taster and then selling your paid products is a tool you can use within measure so you have to ex experiment with stuff yeah awesome um cool okay. so yeah lionel uh just asks if uh there will be uh i have to go will the remaining slides be available offline and sure we can provide people uh also with a recording of everything and also with the slides if they want okay, to, awesome. to watch yeah. it again i can um, send that sure um okay i'll dismiss that lionel hope you heard me and then a pant asks uh, he's reporting uh, reposting an older question and how to go about yeah, narrowing down a target audience now it's a great moment to go through that yeah and okay. he says just quickly let me read yeah. it uh, uh, if you want to shoot elopements and destinations people say you should decide who to target bride is like how much money she spends do you have any thoughts on that okay yes a lot of thoughts thank you for asking um, a pant. I, I, sorry, I don't have your name, but, uh, let me tell you how, how I, I would approach that. First of all, we all have, or should have ideal customers. Okay. That ideal customer, if your business is brand new, you might not know who that person is just yet, but you will eventually, once you start booking clients and when you start putting in all the work that it takes, you will know. If you want to clarify some of this, feel free to feel free to ask another question and tell me if you already figured this out. Once you kind of know who that customer is, what you need to do is build a buyer persona, okay? That buyer persona, it, this is a marketing concept, but I, I, if you don't know what it is, I'm gonna try to make it that simple for everybody that's still watching. Thank you guys, we still have a bunch of you connected. So what I would say is building that buyer persona is gathering as much information as you can about a single person not a group of people so in your particular case you say uh queer target bride is like so i'm, I'm assuming that you're targeting elopements elopements are destinations okay so let's talk about a bride i'm a wedding photographer myself i know who my ideal customer is exactly like from a to c i could tell you everything about them because i've been talking to that people for 10 years Let's say you don't know who yours is yet. We have like a target that we can like broaden the range and just narrowing down quite a bit. So let's say your bride will, it's a person, first of all, she's getting married. So she's anywhere between 23 and 30, 35 years old. That's my average bride's age. I'm not saying yours is the same, but anywhere between 24 and 30 is usually what you, who you want to target. Then you need to, put that person a name, okay? So any name that you can think of. Just for the sake of this, I'll call her Mar Mary, okay? Mary is 27 years old. She lives in New Jersey. She's from a certain, I, I don't wanna use the wrong wording here, especially because I'm translating from Spanish. She's from a certain ethnic group. So she could be either um, white or African-American or Hispanic, or I don't want to guess who your customer is, but you need to target a specific person. So let's say she lives in New Jersey. Most people in New Jersey, based on my knowledge, sorry if I'm mis in, mis uh, mistaken, most people in New Jersey look a certain way. She's blonde, she's white, she's 27. She's studying to be a nurse. And then you're asking how much money she spends. Well, that depends on what are you selling? Are you selling premium luxury stuff? Because you can, you can target your, your customers. They could be spend, they could be earning 
$2,000 a month or, or they could be earning $15,000 a month. And I have people in all those, I have clients in all those ranges. So once you kind of figure out who he or she is, your, she in this case is Mary, you need to find out what she likes, what she's into. Um, half of my brides told me that they like to do online shopping. They like to go hiking in the mountains. They kind of outdoorsy people. They like, they usually have pets. Some of them even, even love to bring their dogs. I do destination weddings. Some of them would love to bring their dogs here, but they cannot. So I know they absolutely love their dogs. They even have pictures of their dogs in the middle of the ceremony. So I know everything about them. So if you kind of need to write all this down and once you know who she is, what she consumes, you need to find out what she care about, what she cares about. Does she care about saving money? Does she, does she care about traveling the world? Does she care about looking like a princess on her wedding day? Or she actually cares about uh, sh like showing intimacy with her partner? Is she all about love and that kind of people that talks like airy people and, and they're all about love? Well, if she is, then you address that. You talk to that specific person and you create content for them. You educate them in what they need, why should they hire you, and all these things that will make you create a connection with them, okay? So once you know who she is, what she likes, what she consumes, what she cares about, then the biggest question you need to answer is, where does she hang out? Does she hang out on Instagram, on TikTok, on Pinterest? I know myself, I don't know if it's your case, but I know that 80 or 90% of my brides have a Pinterest board. They love Pinterest. So I know that's a perfect place for me to advertise my services, to show what I do. So if they go through Pinterest and they look for my location and I'm the go-to person because half of the pictures in their Pinterest boards are mine, they're gonna hire me. There's no question. Like, why would they hire somebody else? Because I'm I either suck at uh, marketing or connecting with them because if not, if they ask, if they ask, if they send me an email and I reply promptly and give them information, that's all you need to sell your stuff. You just need to gather a specific person. And it's what we were talking about during the elevator pitch. Who do you serve and what makes you different? Okay. And if you figure that out, who do you serve is the key question here. Okay. So get in touch and um, get in touch with, with, a couple people that look like that and ask them questions, get some feedback and then create a content strategy for them. Um, just to super, super confirm what you've been saying, I just yeah. want to give some, a, a couple of examples just to awesome. clarify what you meant by a vague target audience and yeah. a very specific one. It's two examples that I gathered from past emails. I'm, I'm going to post it into the chat and read them out. So maybe people watching the recording just say it. So here's what a photographer said. I would like to appeal to all age groups and locations. I would like to appeal to as wide a, an audience as possible. And at the same time, sell some photos. Hmm. Yeah. This photographer is basically marketing to everyone and no one. It's it, nothing. And here's a good example just so you can get a sense of how specific it can be. My ideal client is a mother of one or two young children aged zero to six, American, European, or Middle Eastern, educated in the US or UK. She's a professional woman with a high managerial position in marketing, IT, creative field, or has her own business. She's from a double income household of around 100,000 pounds, loves travel, wants the best for her kids, but suffer, suffers from the typical mother's guilt most of the time. Is she working too much? It's, it's an example of a persona of how you can picture your target audience. Isn't that what makes it then much more easier to know what to put on your website, how to market to people, what types of work to create? It's exactly what you've been saying, Gaston. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and what you have right there at the very bottom, which says, 
wants the best for her kids, but suffers from typical mother's guilt, is what I was talking about when I was mentioning the fears. We all fear different things. So when, once you understand what do they fear, fix that. Fix it for them. Tell them how you can help them fix it. If it's through your photography or through your story or through your branding, there's always a way you can help your clients, your, your, your target clients. Yeah. So after you figured out what your audience is, what should you do? Of course, you, you need to start saying no to the wrong type of clients, which is what we, I think we covered that a bit on a previous slide, which is here. You start saying no to the wrong clients and then you try to find new ones. You, I don't know, you go back to past clients with a new service, with your new niche, because you already have some experience with them, or you just figure out other ways to find new clients that serve your more narrow niche. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, Javier, um, how do you manage traveling to shoot a wedding and the country laws about immigration? That is very specific. Uh, I don't know which passport you have. I don't know which country you're traveling to. So that is absolutely different for everybody. Um, I'm not the right person to answer that. Uh, what I can say is I've shot weddings in Canada and in the USA, and I simply boarded a plane, got there, took my cameras, and I went and shoot, and I didn't have all these issues because I'm lucky enough to have a passport that allows me to travel pretty much everywhere without any hassle. With a work visa, you can't shoot in the USA technically. Exactly. No, you cannot, Javier. Uh, you shouldn't do that. It's, uh, it's really up to you again. I'm not a lawyer. I wouldn't advise you to do any of that. I know for a fact that if you go there and, you, and they ask you, hey, why are you here? And you say, I'm here to shoot a wedding, they'll send you back to your country. So uh, I actually know someone who had that problem and I wouldn't recommend you to do that. In my case, my weddings were also part of a bigger trip. Uh, in the US and Canada, I went to, into holidays for a couple of weeks and I shot a wedding. And honestly, it worked for me, but I'm not telling you to do it. I would encourage to do that, especially if you have some problems with immigration. That's, that's something you need to figure out on yourself, to be honest. We're more focused on the photography part than, and, than, than everything else. All right, I hope that works for you. I think we're good. If anybody else has any questions, we're about to be done with this. Uh, if you do have questions, we'd love to answer them because we're all like a lot over our, our yeah. estimated time. Um, but from the feedback we saw in the chat, it, it seems it was helpful to a lot of people. Um, yeah, no, no new questions coming in. Um, yeah. So I think, I think we're done. And just to, uh, a, a few questions that people sent uh, during the chat uh, were about the recording. We aim to do that. We okay. were recording both. So we'll try to provide everyone who registered, registered for this, even if you couldn't make it live with a recording. Cool. Christina says, great webinar with lots of info to consider. Thanks guys. Cool. Yeah. Marcos as well. Thank you guys for glad you found it useful. Yeah. For staying here for so long with us. And um, just like the slide says, and just like Alex said, if you have any further questions, reach out to email. We'll be happy to help. Um, if you want someone to design your website, Alex is the best at that. He focuses on photography websites. So he's your guy. If you need coaching with the marketing part or with anything else regarding your photography business, I'm the person who can help you with that. But uh, anyways, guys, thank you for staying this long and, and for asking all those great questions. Cool. Thank you, That's Alex. Goodbye for me as well. Thank you as well, Gaston. Um, yep. See you soon. It was awesome. See you soon. Bye-bye.